Hello, welcome everyone to this session on how tech investments can blend social impact and financial return. Now we have with us uh, th three speakers, John Colombo, who is the Indonesia country manager at Climb Capital, which makes early stage development capital investments in clean energy businesses in Indonesia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. Now, Patama Capital also invests in early stage companies in emerging economies, and we have that as partner at the firm, Don D. Hananto. And representing the other side of the equation, we have Tana Sullivan, Group Head of Sustainability at GoTo, which has pledged its commitment to net zero goals. So thank you to our speakers for joining us for this discussion on what is an increasingly important aspect in business and investment. And we've all seen the sort of devastating effects of climate change and you know there's a real impetus for change. So how can investors and, and companies take up the mantle? And for the efforts to be truly sustainable, how does one ensure that they are also financially viable? So maybe Dondi, we can start with you. Um, your firm has been investing for impact for the last decade and you have been, you know, invest, impact investing even before joining uh, Patama. Could you take us through the opportunity that you saw then and how the industry has evolved since? Yes, sure. Thanks, Michelle, and hi, everyone. Um, well, for me, my journey into impact investing was um, actually a bit of a personal journey. So I started my career in commercial banking um, here in Indonesia, spent all my career in Indonesia. And, um, you know, a lot of that was um, working with retail and SME um, lending products. So got really interested in SME lending, especially because I can see that, you know, when, when you're giving out um, credit cards, people use it to shop for whatever commercial products. Whereas when you um, give SME loans, then it's mostly used for uh, productive uh, purposes, right? So that, that got me very interesting. Uh, that got me very interested to um, find out of ways to implement what I have learned and I have practiced. So basically all about financial uh, products into, um, you know, into impactful uh, 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 purposes, right? And then I think at that time I got exposed to, um, you know, reading about Grameen Bank um, in Bangladesh, um, got really interested into microfinance. I moved, um, in, uh, I moved to another bank to actually run a microfinance uh, business and then got interested into equity because then, you know, banks can only give debt. Um, whereas um, in the early 2010s, um, you know, when you're a small company just starting up and looking for equity, there was basically almost nobody who will invest in you, right? So um, got interested into, um, into the equity side, um, learned a bit, and got connected to my partners from Patamar Capital as um, we built our first fund in Southeast Asia and decided to join. So um, a bit of a personal journey, but also, as, as, as you mentioned, um, realize that for emerging markets like us, it's, it's a huge opportunity to actually be able to um, do investment, um, make money uh, as, as always, and um, of course, do, do good at, at the same time. Right, but how has you know the industry or the, 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 the opportunity set evolved over the past 10 years or so since you started? I think what's, what's really interesting is that now um, we are really seeing a merge of um, investors, whether they're um, impact focused like us or um, you know, general uh, tech VCs, looking at similar deals you know so um you know 10 years ago i remember looking at uh, looking at our pipeline there was basically almost nobody else interested in investing in them uh, because they just deemed to be you know very weird um, not many people understand it but now i think um you know as as um funds also flowing into southeast asia and indonesia um, we are we are seeing a lot more deals where we actually co-invest with um, you know, mainstream um, tech VC investors, which I think is great. It, it opens up a lot of opportunity and, and options for the entrepreneurs as well. Right. Um, John, maybe we can go to you next in terms of, you know, the firm is uh, raising a 50 million vehicle 
targeting investments in clean energy in key markets in Southeast Asia, um, including Indonesia. Um, so what is the impetus here and how does capital make a difference? Well, Climb Capital sees clean tech and, and renewable energy as essentially the next frontier of early stage investments in Indonesia and other markets. We, we also invest in, in Vietnam and the, in the Philippines. We really believe that the next generation of, you know, leading Indonesian companies, some people like the term unicorns, uh, will, will be companies that are driving the clean energy transition or other, other also companies that are supporting it, right? Um, and they'll generate value for investors by tackling what's essentially our biggest global challenge while also saving consumers money and improving quality of life. To date, we've made investments in renewable power generation. Um, as you've noted, we, we've also invested in emerging and fast growing sectors like uh, e-mobility uh, through our investment in OICA, um, uh, you know, uh, commercial and industrial solar uh, with uh, Surya, and uh, most recently actually in energy efficiency with an investment in Synergy Energy uh, Solutions. Uh, energy efficiency is an area that we believe has enormous and basically untapped uh, opportunity in Indonesia. Early stage capital can make a difference, you know, really by de-risking projects in the case of, you know, infrastructure projects where you need bankable, uh, you know, uh, early stage work done. Uh, on projects to, uh, you know, assess in the case of wind or solar projects, the resource potential um, and really put together a viable opportunity. Um, and then in the case of businesses, uh, you know, we can be kind of that uh, early stage catalyst that helps businesses develop their internal capacity uh, and get to a point where more traditional investors um, are comfortable enough to invest. I mean, these are still new new sectors, right? And so a lot of the existing players, you know, may not be fully comfortable with, with some of these sectors or, or just, you know, may not be part of their investment guidelines. And so we can, we can sort of play a role in terms of being a bridge for companies to get to the point where they can bring on follow-on capital. Mm. Wonder if you could uh, sort of give some examples of the kinds of conversations that take place. For example, when you say, you know, in terms of getting investors to come on board where they perhaps weren't previously so so involved. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a. It's a. It, it's always a, an interesting conversation, but also a very fruitful one. And you know, we've uh, we've seen. Uh, a lot of success. Uh, our our first investment, uh, Surya, has had a lot of success in in raising follow-on capital. Um, yeah, I think we have a lot of uh, a lot of confidence in in the rest of our uh, portfolio, not only here but also in in Vietnam and, and the Philippines, where we've invested in both utility scale solar and wind. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that. Uh, that conversation is really about risk, and and uh, you know some of these, some some of the more traditional investors uh, may may look at a at a at a given business, uh, especially, uh, and and maybe not understand the revenue model yet, or or understand it, but want to see more traction in the market. Um, I think where we can fill an important role is by coming in and, and taking that early stage risk alongside uh, the, 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 the founders, right? Um, and, and really go on that journey with them and bring the business along to a point where that traction can be demonstrated. Uh, and and it's, it's no longer uh, something that's um, theoretical, but rather, you know, uh, a, a viable business, and um, we look a lot. Investors want to be in this space, and and if anything, are getting a lot of uh, pressure. Funds, in particular, are you know really, really getting pressure, and and so we 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 hope that um, it's not just us, in, you know, uh, but that more more join the party and and, and make early stage investments. 
Right. Um, I mean, I wonder whether the profile of the LPs in the funds have sort of, have you seen a change in, in, in the investors that have come on? I mean, this question for John and um, Dondi as well. Sure. I mean, uh, the profile of the LPs plays a big role. And we're, we're fortunate to have LPs that empower us really uh, to take early stage risk, to align our, uh, ourselves with our investees. Um, you know, but again, I, I think across the board, you're going to see more and more existing funds. Uh, their LPs are going to be moving in this direction as well. Right. How about for Patama Capital, Dandi? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's um, we as 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 John said. I think it's it's important to be aligned with the LPs and the, for the LPs to um, you know have the same goals as what we're trying to do, and also the companies that we ultimately invest in. Right. So um, interestingly, we have a we have a, a, a quite a mix of um, LPs right now. Our LPs come from um, all over the world. Um, um, of course, from Asia, but also from US, um, Australia, and, and, and a bit from Europe. And also the types are pretty, uh, a pretty wide range. There are, of course, um, some family offices um, who are interested in this and are um, starting to allocate their investments into impact and emerging markets. Uh, but also at the other end, there are a couple of pension funds who um, have um, one of one of our pension fund LPs actually has committed 100% of their fund uh, for impact, which is which is great. And um, the the other one has um, you know they 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 haven't allocated 100%, but uh, as I understood, quite a big chunk of their portfolio is allocated for um, impact and emerging markets. So I think that's it's it's actually quite interesting to see uh, the the mix. Um, of course, I think the um, the way um, uh, people define and measure impact um, is is still under a lot of evolution. So um, a lot of people do things differently. Um, we're also right. Maybe Tana will come to you first. Um, I think it seems that investors are quite aligned in the sort of where we are, you know, going towards in terms of being able to, to have some tangible uh, impact. Coming back to you, Tana. So you were appointed as the head of sustainability at GoTo in 2020. And soon after, I mean, an ESG framework was launched at the company. Um, I mean, could you take us through some of the key changes in, in a very practical sense at the company since, since that was done? Sure, thanks, Michelle. Um, look, I think there's two layers to this. One is from a governance standpoint, so what we've embedded um, in terms of ESG into our governance structure. And then secondly, from an operational standpoint, so how we're actually practically applying these ESG kind of targets and policies and what have you into our business processes and planning cycles and so forth. So on the first one, I think on governance, this has been, I mean, it was fundamental as a first step for us as a company. Um, we built the ESG framework, not in a silo, but rather um, through you know, hundreds of hours of, of consultations and interviews that we conducted with a very diverse group of stakeholders, um, you know, understanding that we no longer or no, not only serve our shareholders, but rather um, the myriad of diverse stakeholders across our ecosystem. And that includes our driver partners, our merchants, our users, our employees, um, and of course, our leadership as well. Um, and from that, we actually came up with our material ESG um, issues, so risks and opportunities. And that's actually what went into the, the framework. The framework outlines our company's position on those material ESG issues. Um, it outlines also how often and how regularly we conduct these materiality assessments to make sure that we're staying on top of not just what we believe is important for us to address as a company, but rather what all our stakeholders um, are also telling us are important to them. Um, and then of course, kind of prioritizing where we would believe we would have the most impact, um, you know, because not every issue, we can't tackle every issue, especially in our first years um, as we're embarking on this sustainability journey. So for us, it's really about targeting the most practical, the most feasible, but also the most impactful um, kind of areas. Um, I think 
practically what we've done since launching the framework. Um, we've really integrated ESG into all of our existing business processes and, and planning, as I mentioned before. So this is everything um, as it relates to, for example, our group-wide risk management system. Rather than having a standalone environmental and social kind of risk management system, we have embedded ESG risks and considerations into our enterprise-wide risk management system. The same goes for our procurement policies, our recruitment and, and training policies, our basically anything that requires a policy, um, we've actually done a sweep through and made sure that we've included ESG considerations into them or ESG conditions and terms and what have you. So it's not just for us as a company, but also applies to our vendors, our suppliers, our partners as well. Um, so it's really kind of built into our infrastructure. For us, this was incredibly important because we wanted ESG to eventually become an organic part of how our company is run rather than Oh, we have an ESG or a sustainability function. So, you know, it's their problem and they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna, you know, be on top of it every year. Well, no, it's not actually what, you know, that's not actually how it happens in practice. Um, and I think what what has also been quite important from a governance standpoint is really putting this on a leadership agenda. So, you know, regularly, it's not just me, but the team and all the relevant business units who make sure that we have that kind of regular engagement with our senior leadership. Um, they not just endorse, but have to buy in and, and really kind of support and, and be part of how we implement and operationalize our ESG goals, um, which I'll get into a little bit later. But for us, it was, you know, it was making sure that we were transparent and accountable at all levels, including the top decision makers of our company. Um, so they're equally invested in this with us. Um, and so business units and, and functions and, and teams within the whole go-to ecosystem, we all really know the leadership is rallied behind this. Um, and so you can follow it by not just the policies and, 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 and frameworks that we've set, but also where our budget is going or where you know, resources are allocated and so forth. So it really is evident throughout the entire company infrastructure. Right. I mean, given the scale of the operations, I mean, I was really just going to ask also, you know, are there challenges and, um, you know, what, what does the, if it comes down to it, what does the, the, the driver or the customer see or, or have to do? What changes do they have to make, for example? So I don't know that I can, I can summarize just a, a handbook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but of course, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, the biggest challenge, right, is getting started. Um, I think there's a lot of companies are hesitant because one, there's the alphabet soup of ESG standards and what does it mean? What are the implications? I think um, it was mentioned earlier by one by one of the other panelists around, you know, what it's a very kind of murky and complicated space to navigate in. And if there's no clear kind of guidelines and there's no um, it's not like it's all like emissions reporting, for example, where it's very black and white and you have bodies like the Science Based Targets Initiative, you have the GHG protocol, which is, again, very black and white in terms of how you report and how you account your carbon emissions every year. There are social, there are other environmental, waste being one of them, there's other um, social and governance indicators that do not have that same kind of um, universally aligned, um, you know, con general consensus around what those reporting um, and accounting metrics should be. And so th that can be incredibly, um, I guess, um, you know, confronting if you've never done it before, you've never looked into it, and you definitely don't have in-house expertise on it. So I think that's been probably for us in the beginning, it was really, okay, what do we need to take first? It's definitely an inventory and a baseline to understand properly where we're at on each of our material ESG issues. Um, and so doing that in itself, I think was incredibly informative um, and helped us define what our strategy was going to be responding to each of those ESG issues. Then we, after having the actual strategy, it was then making sure that all the business units who ultimately are responsible for, and the business lines who are ultimately responsible for operationalizing these strategies, um, you know, a strategy is only as good as the paper. <laughs> I think that I think that's the saying, as the paper it's written on, right? Um, because you really need to understand the operational realities of what these business teams face every day. And so, even myself and and the team, you know, spending days and weeks with you know our teams in the fulfillment centers, our teams who are working with our drivers, our merchants, to really make sure that we have that understanding. So we're not just coming up with recommendations or a strategy in a silo. Um, and then bringing them in as part of that process, because I think that's incredibly important and they have really great um, input and insight to add to it. Um, 
and then they actually can co-own and, and, and kind of co-lead these efforts um, within their respective teams. But getting that kind of alignment is incredibly difficult. So I think those are the two, two things I would, I would name for now. One is getting started and knowing how to start when there's just so much out there going on from an ESG standpoint. Um, and then second is getting that internal alignment, I think, you know, once you have all your ducks in a row, it, it can become pretty organic, but just to get there can be and feel like a grind, especially when the perception internally might be that you are a cost center. Um, if you are a sustainability team um, person or person uh, within a company, and you really have to make sure that you have that business case and all the data points and, 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 and help shift the mindset towards this is an investment in our company's future. Um, so that's, if I can summarize, that would be it. Yeah, great. Yeah, really. It's such an undertaking, as Lexi said, no? uh, an investment in the future. But what, what I was going to ask you is if we were to take a step back, why is it so important for go to really to, to lead the charge, as it were, and to commit, um, as you have done, to, to the three zeros? I would say that, I mean, this has always been somewhat embedded in you know, so before the union to form GoTo Group, we were Gojek, we were Tokopedia. Um, and in both companies' histories, you can see from inception, you know, impact or well, positive impact was always part of their kind of core mission in a way. Um, and, and now collectively as GoTo Group, um, what we're trying to do is really provide a systematic strategic approach to ESG and impact overall. Um, I think the three zero commitments that we made were zero emissions, zero waste and zero barriers. Um, they were incredibly important in getting us. So one is, is setting kind of a North Star for the entire company um, so that within the company, we are clear about what those three zeros mean and then being able to articulate that into the respective business units. Because for example, zero emissions may not make so much sense um, for a team working at our fulfillment center as it might for our transport and our driver teams, right? Um, where they're actually out there where we know almost 95% of our footprint comes from um, the use, use of, of um, sold products and services on our platform being mobility um, on the GoTech side. So things like that, I think it, it's, it's, it was incredibly important to have those three zeros so that everyone understood one, what the commitments were, and then second, what we were actually, like what roadmaps we were following, what annual targets we were setting for ourselves, whether it relates to the um, you know, adoption rate of electric vehicles in our fleet to um, the shift of our offices and workplaces to renewable energy source power, um, all those things matter, um, I think, and, and contribute overall to those roadmaps. Um, we definitely didn't make these 2030 commitments without the due diligence and consideration and analysis, um, because it really wanted to provide kind of ambitious and inspiring, yet also somewhat practical and feasible um, targets and goals for our company. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we're closely aligned to our company's kind of values, um, business strategy and priorities overall, because otherwise, if you didn't, um, you know, again, these, these things very easily either fall between the cracks or become a siloed effort that's, you know, outside of what the company is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, at the right. same time, I think globally, sorry, I think globally, everyone can see that ESG, I mean, the trend is saying it, everyone is heading towards more stringent ESG enforcement, whether it's from a regulatory standpoint or from a reporting standpoint. Um, and so for us, that's why it was incredibly important to preempt a lot of those changes that we foresaw um, to ensure that we already had existing kind of robust, transparent, credible reporting practices within our company, that we were disclosing metrics that were, you know, internationally verified in what, what, whatever ways we could, um, so that it wasn't going to be as painful to do later on, because if anyone who's done this before comprehensively, it is incredibly complex to make sure that you have the right data to support um, and back up whatever you're saying in an ESG report. I mean, you treat it as seriously as you would your financial report, if indeed you do consider your ESG performance as, as much of an indicator of your company's success or not, um, as you would financial performance. Right, so coming to the investors now for John and Dondi, from your perspective, I mean, how do you assess, you know, a company's sustainability practices, particularly when it comes to companies in really early stages of the of the development, um, maybe John, you want to take it first. Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, certainly assessing health, safety, environmental, governance issues is you know the, the practices of a company or or you know or uh, characteristics of a particular project in the case of infrastructure. Its core 
it's a core part of both our due diligence, but also our monitoring and, um, and our ongoing interaction with the investee. We, we integrate ESG considerations systematically into our investment process to ensure, you know, really that risks and opportunities are consistently identified, you know, assessed and managed. Um, so we, we do dive deep into these issues early, I would say. I would say, I mean, even prior to, to re, 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 very early on, we dive into these issues and we try to risk gate, risk gate our investments accordingly um, and make sure that um, to the extent that, you know, ESG, maybe not issues, but opportunities uh, for, for further deepening of, you know, capacity with a, with a given company. You know, Tana uh, laid out really what is the gold standard uh, for, for a company, um, you know, in, in go-to in terms of really integrating all of, all of these considerations. We're, to the extent that we're dealing with earlier stage companies, we'd like to um, help them through our investment achieve that. Um, so we try to help, um, you know, companies tackle these issues. A portion of our investment is often oriented toward building internal resources, uh, putting companies in a position where they can strengthen uh, core ESG related competencies. Uh, to the extent there are gaps, we, you know, we want to make sure that they're addressed both in terms of the policies that are in place, but also their existing operations, um, vendors, suppliers, everything. Um, and honestly, this this is uh, this puts companies in a better position when they want to raise follow-on financing. Um, it really does. And um, you know, sometimes ex traditional investors may be less in a position to assess risk uh, related to ESG absent, you know, clear and established policies and safeguards of, 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 of the kind that, that Tano is describing. So, yeah. Right. I think the other factor at play here also is that you are investing in early stage companies in emerging markets in, in particular. I mean, for you, Dondi, how, how do you sort of assess the company's um, practices, but, and also, you know, balance the, the risk and return in this area? Yeah, I think uh, that's that's always a very interesting question, right? One thing one thing for sure is um, we definitely look for businesses where the impact is embedded, right? And and it's not an afterthought or um, you know an, an extra cost for the company. Um, and there's there's a lot of things uh, there's, there's a lot of models that 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 um, can actually do that. And um, you know, as as for us, um, I think in terms of measurement. Um, it is very complicated, and I think, um, as, as I mentioned, a lot of uh, people, global investors around the world are also still trying to, to figure out the best way to measure impact, right? And especially because we are a multi-sector fund, um, we invest in very different companies, there's no single metric that can rule them all, right? So, so um, very different from, for, for example, one of my um, partners, uh, used to run a microfinance fund in India, where basically he invested in microfinance in um, microfinance institutions. Uh, so these are basically very similar business models. So, so you can use a couple of um, specific metrics to, to track everything. And then, um, you know, you can you can collate them um, as, as the fund uh, uh, performance. But here it's, it's, it's very different. Um, what's what's really important for us is that obviously as as um, investors who still look for commercial returns we um, during the DD we, we assess the uh, the founder the business model very very closely uh, but also part of that DD I think is very important in the early days when when um, getting to know the entrepreneurs uh, is for us to assess the intentionality uh, for for them and how important is is that impact for them right so they may not have ways to measure it yet but um, I think it's important to hear from them um, the articulation of why they think um, their, their business uh, is actually making impact to, to um, the different stakeholders. So what we do a lot really is usually, um, you know, that is done before the investment um, assess. 
assess the intentionality and also get uh, their agreement that um, you know uh, one of the implications of getting us as an investor is that we will ask for additional impact metrics right so so it's important for us to also work with the team in the early days to figure out which metrics that's best to use of um, the evidence of their impact and ensure that it's practical because again building an early stage business is um, already so damn difficult on its own right so we don't want to burden them with um, you know additional work so trying to find things uh, metrics that are practical uh, i think is also important so in general what what we do is um, we're a member of the global impact investing network or gin gin and they do have a catalog of metrics called iris plus um, that's um, you know that, that we can pick and choose what type of metrics for different companies um, that's linked to SDG so that's um, you know I think a good common language that's understood by others so you know that's that's the way you know obviously besides all the um, business opportunities and and um, you know the, the market sizing um, that is linked to uh, that is going to be linked to the financial performance of the company and, and our fund um, that's um, what we try to do to um, measure and, and also report the impact. Right. Um, the question still for you, Dondi, is, um, you know, if you could give us some examples of like what you said earlier in terms of looking for businesses where the impact is already embedded. And also in the sense, how has capital actually made a difference? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll use an example of my, my favorite example is always this um, Mapan was our first investment um, in Indonesia back in 2013. So um, we, um, the, for, for us, our fund's thesis is investing in companies that touch the mass market or the emerging middle class. So that's translated into sectors of financial services or financial inclusion, um, micro and SME, agriculture, healthcare, education, and all that. And, and then what, what, Map, what what's interesting about the story of Mapan was that um, we actually uh, met Aldi, the founder, when he was still doing his master's in, in the US. And, you know, he had this great idea. He went through a couple of, um, uh, a couple of um, you know, pitching sessions. And, um, you know, he actually also, um, interestingly, met Nadim uh, back there, and, um, and again back then, 2013, uh, he was, um, and then we 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 actually met them. Uh, we, we actually met him in, in in the US. My partners in the US met him, so it was interesting. Where at that point he was saying, yeah, it's, it's it's so difficult to find investors for for my company, um, and we were actually one of the. Uh, we were we we led their initial seed round and, and was the first um, institutional investors. So obviously for for Mapan, you know, they uh, work with communities who may not have access to traditional e-commerce through their agents. Uh, what we probably now um, you know call social commerce. Uh, so their 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 impact is really two prong, right? There's there's the agents, and these agents are mostly uh, female. Um, it gives them additional income for the household uh, from from selling the, the products from from uh, Mapan. And um, the way we measure the impact here is the average income uh, of these agents and compare that to the minimum wages. And, and then for the end, end for the end customers, it's actually very interesting how um, you know sometimes we take things for granted, um, you know, just just like basic goods like proper furniture, pots and pans for our kitchens. Um, it, it's actually not very easy for for the end consumers of Mapan to access these goods um, with proper quality and at normal prices. Right? That's that's always the, the, the issue for them. So um, you know the, the, the impact on that point is that you know they can they can get access to, to these quality products uh, with normal prices and also because Mapan um, implements an Arisan model or um, what we probably call rotational savings in English. It helps them to be able to afford these products as well. So that's that's really interesting, right? And and obviously it was it was it was a great business. Uh, the company grew well since we invested, and then actually um, got acquired by Gojek back in 2018. And Aldi, the founder, then became the CEO and let GoPay and and built Go financial to what it is which is which is i think very interesting and always um a good example of of a story where 
uh, uh, a company can can actually have business success and um, also achieve the impacts. So looking for more mapans um, throughout the region, obviously. Right. Right. I think the question I was also going to ask as a follow on from this is, you know, how do we take ESG um, from going beyond a risk management um, tool or aspect to something that drives um, financial performance, something that drives growth, you know, uh, maybe John? Sure. Um... You know, we're focused on providing early stage risk capital. Um, so, you know, we identified this, uh, especially in the, the sectors where we invest, uh, which, you know, I think maybe a bit a diff, uh, we're, we're, we're maybe a, a bit more fo um, uh, focused on specifically clean energy, uh, less multi sectoral, although. What we often find is that the multi-sectoral companies are, are kind of part of the ecosystem in which the companies we invest operate, right? Uh, but you know, we, we're, we're focused on several sectors, uh, power generation, energy efficiency, e-mobility, storage. Um, and we identified early on early stage capital in these sectors as something that just wasn't present in the market. And so you'd have early stage companies that couldn't grow. Uh, because they couldn't find uh, early stage risk capital on terms that actually made sense, right? That were that were aligned with the interests of uh, of the founders, right? Um, so we, you know, we we do take uh, significant risk um, that private existing private sector investors may not be able or willing to take a loan uh, in order to help enable clean energy businesses open up pathways to to fall on capital and we sort of manage that risk by again aligning ourselves with our investees uh, we take risk alongside them we focus on more on potential shared upside rather than downside protection which can be you know if you focus too much on downside protection at this stage, especially in, in these new sectors, it can be counterproductive and can put young companies in a difficult position. Um, we also, um, you know, look to, to take early stage risk in the clean energy sector, you need a team with real experience in these areas. Uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate to have that. Um, you know, um, in, in terms of how we, you know, view returns or, or financial performance, um, we, we invest in, of course, we invest in businesses to, re, to achieve a return. And, and you know, in, in the case of um, infrastructure projects, uh, that's generally driven by the fact that, you know, of course, we know that, uh, you know, power generation projects, if they're on grid, sell to the state on grid. Um, we all, uh, and, but the, the reality is that uh, renewable energy is, is achieving parity, even on a marginal cost basis uh, with fossil fuels. So that's really the driver of the returns, you know, from, you know, from, from these projects. Um, to the extent that we invest in businesses that are more open-ended and scalable in their ambitions, um, you know, they can attract follow-on capital. And, and we've had that experience already, uh, which allows them to kind of scale up and, and lead the low carbon transition quickly. Um, that may include investment from more traditional investors, um, but, you know, they've gained sufficient um, you know, comfort uh, with with these businesses after, you know, following the catalytic investment from CSEF that has uh, brought the companies along. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Um, also, to follow on, uh, maybe for for Vadondi also, in the sense that you know we speak about um, clean energy and microfinance, but just wondering whether you will consider these to be sort of lower hanging fruits, or are there sectors or other particular segments that you see are uh, undercapitalized um, that are, you know, have yet to attract um, sort of investor attention in, in which you can, you see opportunity. 
yeah, I think for for us, um, you know, the the sectors that that we pick really is um, also not not just about the impact, but also down to um, our belief that the growth in the markets that we're in, and we're predominantly in Indonesia, Vietnam, and and Philippines, um, you know, and that we that what what we believe is that the the growth of these markets, um, micro, microeconomically wise, uh, will uh, bring the new uh, middle class, right? So that's why we we invest in in companies that that touches that that sector. So um, I think yes, I would say um, you know there there is of course a challenge uh, for for us to be able to uh, prove the. Um, economic viability of of these investments, right? So, and obviously, um, you know, because because we are structured as a um, plain vanilla VC fund, ten years fund life, you know, then we need to think of companies that um, will be able to uh, provide that return within within the fund life, right? So that's that's really important. So what's what what is also quite interesting is that I'm um, you know I I have recently met a couple of uh, funds who are looking to um, look actually even even longer term right so that they can invest in in companies that might take a lot more time to um, to generate returns uh, but you know that also means then you have to ensure that the fund structure fits that um, that cycle right so they're trying to build an evergreen fund um, I'm I'm not sure how difficult that is because obviously that's something that's that's um, not done a lot. But um, I think that's that 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 will be um, very interesting. And actually, some some of them were um, looking at um, renewable energies as well because um, again, in, in 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 our markets, it's it's pretty nascent, right? So I really admire um, you know people like John and 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 Klein Capital to invest in this in these sectors, uh, which we decided not to invest in just because we we don't understand enough. Of, of the industry. So I think that there needs to be, um, you know, special experts to, to invest there. Right. So for you, um, Tana, in a sense that, you know, apart from um, integrating ESG practices into your operations and your governance framework, as you said before, I mean, are there other ways or opportunities also for go to sort of change the industry, the broader industry in which you operate, you know, through broader initiatives, through perhaps investments outside of the go to family, for example? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think everything we do from an ESG standpoint is really for the betterment of the broader industry and the markets in which we operate. Um, I think we really believe this is a pre-competitive space and with the size and, and I suppose success that we've had so far, um, it's really our responsibility to set a really good precedent and as high a benchmark as possible as we can as it relates to ESG integration. And um, I think we're one of the first of our kind. We're operating an industry that's not as established as others. Um, and that really kind of highlights that we do have to ensure the foundation, the precedents that we set are good ones and are as best as possible aligned to what we would consider kind of industry or global best practice. Um, you know, what we've done to, to, to do this, I think on top of our kind of stringent reporting um, that's, you know, that we ensured was, was audited, that we ensured was in line with global standards, whether it was a, co a, a combination of GRI and SASB standards, um, and making sure that we went through this comprehensive materiality assessment process to really identify the ESG issues that did actually matter, not just to us, but to our stakeholders. So all those things, you know, kind of it, on top of what we've doing, been doing from an operational standpoint, um, I think it's really, for it's, at the stage of the corporate life cycle that we're at, it's not enough to just say we deserve a seat, you know, at the adult table for us, it's, it's about demonstrating and, and making sure we have the evidence to back up that we do not just deserve a seat, but, but actually have a voice in something, um, in something valuable to contribute to this global discussion or regional discussion what's happening um, as it relates to ESG. So for us, because we know, I mean, we're doing as much as we can within our ecosystem, within our company, we do also, you know, know and understand that these are some of these challenges are systemic, meaning that we cannot solve them our, alone and rather than do them piecemeal or try and resolve them piecemeal for us these kind of multi stakeholder partnerships are incredibly critical um, in resolving those challenges in accelerating us getting to the types of solutions that actually, you know, positively benefit not just people in our ecosystem but but beyond that the communities where we operate as well. Um, and so for us that's really for us that's kind of what 
setting a good precedent or a good example looks like for others um, and making sure that we are sharing those insights. We are being transparent about our learnings, our mistakes, our progress along the way. Um, we do that through our ESG report, of course, but there, throughout the year, we have continuous engagement with those stakeholder groups I mentioned earlier um, to make sure that it is a two-way conversation. I think in a lot of cases, you know, people just want to be heard. They want to know that their opinions or perspectives matter and that they have some kind of say in, in how our company's future is shaped and how our ecosystem, you know, grows. And, and we take that incredibly seriously. And so that's, you know, I think what you see as a reflection in, in not just kind of the materiality assessment, does it, it sounds very dry, but it's much, it's much more interesting than in practice. Um, but then also in what we do throughout the year, so that the report is just kind of one milestone um, in, in what is otherwise a continuous year round engagement um, with these stakeholders to make sure you know, that we are on the right track and we're not just surrounding ourselves with yes people, you know, people who are also impartial um, experts, practitioners in this space, whether it be on you know, decarbonization, whether it be on waste management, whether it be on financial inclusion, you know, we, we really engage with all of these stakeholders um, that that will also kind of hold us to to the commitments that we make and, and be as incredibly critical of our of our efforts as well. Um, we want to make sure we have all those perspectives integrated into into and in and informing, um, you know, how we approach ESG overall as a company. So I think those are what I would say is how we're hoping to help the industry um, and, and broadly the more broadly the region as well in, in setting or defining what ESG looks like, um, at least uh, from an application standpoint um, for a company. Right, right. I mean, I imagine as such a major organization, I mean, um, definitely um, you'll be under a lot of scrutiny as it were um, on what you do and how you sort of walk to talk. Um, I mean, in the pandemic, for example, during the pandemic, there was a lot of um, sort of big uptake in food delivery, for example, and then people were noticing just how much more waste um, that sort of contributed um, and, you know, for go-to, I think that might be an issue to, to, to deal with. Well, Michelle, I have what I call, what I call in my household, the drawer of shame. <laughs> so even I am, I am not completely exempt from it, um, from all the, the go food orders that, that, you know, that we make. I do take note of all these, you know, all these things. And of course, what, what consumers are telling us. Um, and, and of course we take it again, very seriously. We were actually conducting our first waste inventory. Um, this is not as, as I mentioned before, black and white as a, let's say an emissions inventory might be. It's largely extrapolative, but for us, it was incredi incredibly important to, to undertake this exercise just so we could see at a very high level in very broad strokes where kind of waste generated from our ecosystem was coming from. The direct waste is, is pretty straightforward, right? It's waste from your offices and, and so forth. But the waste from, as you mentioned, from food delivery or even from on the packaging side from, from our e-commerce, this Wikipedia, it's, I mean, it just, it, it's, it's, it can be very overwhelming when you think about it in metric tons. But, um, but yes, this exercise was incredibly important for us. And then, um, you know, in parallel, investing in alternatives, um, sustainable alternatives, meaning they're either recycled, they can be repurposed, reused, um, because we really want to turn off the tap on, on kind of new and single use packaging entering our ecosystem in the first place and provide our merchants, the sellers, our users with real credible options. Um, and it's not just about, you know, not using a little bit of plastic here or there or making sure that you, you recycle um, but rather that we actually have viable and credible cost-effective solutions and alternatives for them um, and that they're embedded in our platform or in our apps so in our apps so that users can actually do something about it and not just feel overwhelmed um, because it is very easy right right thank you i think that's all the time that we have thank you um, to our speakers john dondi and tana for this discussion and uh, we'll see you for the next one thanks michelle Thank you. Thanks.